Hi and welcome. In this video, we're going to do three things. First, give you a short introduction to the predictive coding theory of perception. Second, introduce the predictive coding theory of attention. And third, briefly outline our criticisms. Let's begin with the basics. Outside our heads, there's a world of things. But we don't have direct access to these things, only their effects on our senses. Complicating this picture is that there's not a one-to-one -one relation between causes in the world and their effects on our senses. One cause can produce many different effects or signals, and different causes can produce the same signal. How then are we able to perceive these hidden causes out in the world? On bottom-up theories of perception, such as the one proposed by David Marr, we build our percepts from the bottom up moving from edges to shapes and so on to build a three-dimensional scene. On top-down theories of perception, such as those proposed by Jakob Hoey, Carl Friston, and Andy Clark, this model gets turned on its head. Let's run through the predictive coding model step by step. So, the task before us is to predict the hidden cause out in the world. To do so, we begin with a generative model whose business is to extract patterns or statistical regularities from the world using this model and use them to generate predictions or hypotheses about what the object or scene in question is. These hypotheses in turn constrain the generation of hypotheses at the lower levels and so on all the way down. For simplicity, I've just got a few levels here. The lowest level hypotheses will be specific to each modality. Here, the hypotheses are compared with the incoming information from the census. If there is a mismatch, then prediction error is generated, represented here by the blue arrows. This prediction error is shunted up the hierarchy, causing the revision of the hypotheses at the level above. If the next level up can't minimize the prediction error, then the prediction error gets pushed farther up the system. The higher the level, the more substantial the revision in the hypothesis. Perception happens when prediction error is minimized, with the winning hypotheses forming the contents of perception. One problem for this picture is that sometimes what our senses receive is noise instead of bona fide signal. Revising a hypothesis on the basis of noise isn't a good idea because this reduces its accuracy. Notice that now we have a problem. Both noise and bona fide signal will generate prediction errors, but we only want to revise our hypotheses on the basis of signal, not noise, so we need a way of differentiating between the two. Luckily, noise occurs in regular patterns as well. For example, the prediction errors generated by vision are less reliable at night than during the day. Those from our hearing are generally less reliable at a noisy party than in a quiet room. From these patterns, we learn a special class of hypotheses about how reliable prediction error will be in a given context. These hypotheses are called precision expectations shown here as the red arrows, and their job is to ensure that our perceptual hypotheses are revised on the basis of signal rather than noise. Those prediction errors that are expected to be precise or reliable are amplified. The gain is turned up. And those that are expected to be imprecise are dampened. The gain is turned down. This ensures that the more reliable prediction errors will drive hypothesis revision, and the ones expected to be less reliable are more likely to be dismissed. So how does attention fit in? On predictive coding, attention is the process of optimizing precision of prediction errors in hierarchical perceptual inference. Let's unpack this with the tools that we've already covered. As we've learned, Expected precision is how reliable or precise we expect the prediction error signal to be in a given context. Hierarchical perceptual inference just is the top-down model we've already seen. So, attention is the process of selecting the prediction errors expected to be the most precise and revising perceptual hypotheses on this basis. As we've seen, 
high expected precision causes pre prediction error to be amplified. And this amplification is attention. The object hypotheses generating the amplified prediction error are those that are attended. To begin to set up our criticism of the theory, we are going to look at the predictive coding account of endogenous attention. Endogenous attention can be divided into several subcategories. We're going to look here at endogenous spatial attention, which is attention guided by spatial expectations, and endogenous feature-based attention, which is attention guided by expectations for certain features. So, we decide to look somewhere, or we decide to look for something. Importantly, feature-based attention can operate independently of spatial attention. Here is a very simple outline of our criticism. The same account of spatial endogenous attention is supposed to apply to feature-based endogenous attention. But applying the account gives us the wrong result. It doesn't work. Let's use the Posner paradigm to illustrate endogenous spatial attention. In the endogenous Q version of the Posner paradigm, subjects are first instructed to keep their eyes fixed on the cross in the center of the screen. Then, a Q, such as an arrow, appears in the center. In valid cases, the arrow points to the location that the start target stimulus will appear, and this decreases the time it takes for subjects to detect the stimulus. This is thought to be a spatial attentional effect. The Q allows subjects to shift their covert attention, that is, attend to the region without moving their eyes, and thanks to the attentional shift, they're faster at detecting the stimulus. So what's the predictive coding story here? First, we have a precision expectation that the arrow Q indicates places where precise prediction error will be generated. Second, the arrow appears on the screen, in this case pointing right. Third, the gain on prediction error for hypotheses involving that region of space is increased. Four, the star appears on the screen. Five, enhanced gain on prediction error for this region, which just is attending to this region, makes it the case that the star is detected or perceived more rapidly. How can we apply this account now to feature-based attention? Here's your endogenous featural cue. I'm going to show you a scene in which Waldo appears. Your job is to find him. If you're like me, his most salient feature is his red and white striped sweater, and so you're going to look for him by expecting this feature. The red and white striped items in this picture likely jumped out at you in a way that you might describe as driving or capturing your attention. What's the PC story here? It's supposed to be the same as the spatial account. Let's walk through it step by step. First, we have a precision expectation that the Q indicates features for which precise prediction error will be generated. Second, the feature Q appears on the screen, in this case, Waldo's red stripes. Three, the gain on prediction error for the featural hypothesis is increased. Four, the red striped objects in the beach pick appear on the screen. And five, enhanced gain on prediction error for feature hypothesis, which is attending to this feature, makes it the case that the object is detected or perceived more rapidly. Our criticism stems on the third point, that the gain on prediction error for the featural hypothesis is increased at this moment. There are two problems with three. The first is that, unlike spatial attention, where we could increase the gain on prediction errors for the spatial region, here there's no actual perceptual hypothesis yet to generate prediction error. To diagnose the problem, the featural hypothesis needs to be selectively applied to the scene, to the space where these objects are located, or these features are located. But this is unknown prior to searching. Lack of spatial expectations for the striped objects or features makes it the case that the hypothesis can't be applied selectively to the scene. In other words, you can't turn up the gain on the red and white striped objects until you've located the red and white striped objects. So, it remains mysterious how attentional selection can occur based on the features of an object, rather than spatial location. 
To understand the second problem, let's go through the predictive coding proposal. Perceptual hypotheses contain a predicted color component. Why not just expect high precision from prediction errors generated by color? Prediction errors are always relative to a hypothesis. There's no such thing as free-floating prediction error. So, more specifically, let's turn up the gain on prediction errors generated by the hypothesis that is red-striped. This would lead us to attend to the items that generate the largest prediction errors with respect to the hypothesis that is red-striped all the items that are not red and white striped. But this is the opposite of what occurs in endogenous feature-based attention. We attend to the red striped objects, not their opposite. So there's something wrong with the theory as it stands. In the paper, we consider a related worry and Andy Clark's reply. We also raise two other problems for the theory of attention. First is that it can't account for attention to our thoughts, and second is that it can't accommodate the guiding role of effective salience on attention. Thanks for watching. Our utmost thanks to Jakob Hoey and Carolyn Dicey Jennings, who have provided really helpful and insightful comments on our paper, as well as to Minds Online for putting this conference together. You can ask us questions about this paper in the comments section at the Brains blog.